So the first talk of this morning um, uh, was given by Dr. Zhu Lansman and uh, on on the on the on her work in the Esolit Laboratory at the University of Central Florida, and then the the her her work, you know, is in a, a I think am I correct in saying it's a it's a consortium, right, of different research groups, um, uh, researchers, and then the, one of the uh, the principal scientists there uh, is a uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Vensante uh, from uh, from Michigan Technological University, and uh, he is going to and I I read that you know, I read that they they just recently have a very interesting project from NASA. And then he said something to do with superconducting cable, something like that. And uh, am I right? And yeah, I don't I'll know show you some a few pictures <laughs> of that in the, in the yeah, talk. There must be a couple of other things uh, going on. So um, just to uh, to get the things going, uh, Paul, can you can you, it's all yours now? Thank you for for having me. So uh, my the topic of the talk is lunar mobility. Uh, I'll touch on a few other things along the way. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm assistant professor since, uh, let's see, one and a half years now at uh, Michigan Technological University here in Houghton, Michigan. Uh, we got about uh, 200 inches of snow every year, so that's always fun. Um, but uh, as part of um, my uh, assistant professorship, I founded a new lab uh, called the Planetary Surface Technology Development Lab which we started in August of uh, 2019. And so as part of that lab, I have a, an 1100 square foot lab space, which contains a, a big sandbox you can see in the top left, uh, in which at that particular picture, you can see a, a slope 45 degrees that we built in there. Uh, the box is filled with a lunar regolith simulant that we um, made ourselves basically. Uh, you can see at the bottom left there we have a, a good particle size distribution and everything to go with that just to make sure that it behaves uh, similar to lunar uh, highlands simulant in this case because it's made from the same minerals as well. We have basaltic scoria and uh, anertite uh, mixed together in certain particle size distributions. Um, in the lab we also have a FANUC robotic arm uh, and an augmented reality sandbox um, we also have a, an ice box so we can just play around with uh, icy frozen uh, sand or regolith if, if we want that uh, to be the case. And then our uh, lab for the inside the, the other, the rest, same lab, we have a bunch of space as well uh, to build and prototype uh, these, these rovers or uh, lunar excavation tools or anything else that, that we want to uh, build and try out. And then the uh, uh, as the French say, pièce de résistance uh, is our uh, new uh, dusty thermal vacuum chamber, uh, which you can see in the picture, uh, the third picture from the left, uh, which is uh, about two meters deep uh, and one and a half meter, uh, meters wide and one and a half meters uh, high. And in that uh, vacuum chamber, we can um, put lunar regolith simulants and we can create basically uh, using this big liquid nitrogen tank, the lunar environment uh, inside uh, that, that chamber. Um, so here you can see some, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you see here a lot of uh, specs about the, the vacuum chamber. So you can see in the, on the picture here, we have a big uh, box that we can fill with lunar regolith and then put in the vacuum chamber uh, and do our experiments with it. Or we can leave it out if we just want to uh, reach temperatures or pressures from the moon without having the lunar simulant in there. Um, we can reach about 1 to 10 to the negative 6 tor. Uh, we can go down to minus 196 Celsius and positive 150 Celsius. Uh, we have about 16 different uh, ports uh, on the chamber for you know, feed throughs or, or other instruments or things like that. Um, and so we, uh, we just started uh, using that about a month ago. Uh, so this is a brand new facility uh, that now is uh, basically fully operational to, uh, to start testing lunar hardware. Um, yeah, I have several grants going on from NASA. One of them was the one you just mentioned about uh, the superconducting cable, which was uh, the NASA Big ID Challenge. Um, and we, uh, we actually won that competition with our, uh, our rover. Uh, the rover 
can deploy a superconducting cable down into the permanently shaded uh, regions on the moon. Um, another facility that I briefly want to uh, point out that we have here at Michigan Tech is, and this relates to mobility, is uh, what we call the QNI Research Center. Uh, this is a former uh, cold regions engineering lab facility where we have a thousand acres of test terrain where we can make all sorts of uh, tracks and courses, uh, any kind of obstacles or slopes or whatever we want to do. Uh, and this is a, um, a facility that, that operates year round. Uh, so like I said, we get 200 to 300 inches of snow every year. And so obviously this picture looks very different at the moment. <laughs> uh, we have uh, lots of snow here. Um, so we have about a hundred companies that come test here, uh, including all the car makers. We have uh, DOD vehicles, uh, NATO did some testing there uh, for winter conditions um, uh, as well. So this is a, a great uh, facility to do mobility testing. Uh, we can do long duration testing by running these loops many, many, many times. Um, we can also, of course, do uh, any kinds of slopes or create uh, particular kinds of terrain that we want. Like I said, we have a, a basalt quarry there, so we can create lots of different things. Okay, uh, enough about those things. So let's talk a little bit more about lunar mobility specifically. Um, so historically speaking, there's been, of course, several vehicles on the lunar surface. Um, the, in the 1970s, we had uh, the uh, Russian Lunokhod 1 and 2, and then the Apollo uh, lunar uh, roving vehicle um, on Apollo 15, 16, and 17. Um, and they drove around on the, the surface. Um, as you can see on, on the right graph here on the moon, uh, the Lunokhod 2 drove around 39 kilometers. Uh, Apollo 17, about 35, almost 36 kilometers. And so those are the furthest ones. The only one that has exceeded that distance uh, has been Opportunity uh, now. Uh, I don't think Curiosity has passed it yet, but I'm sure it will over time. Uh, currently, oops, uh, currently on the moon, of course, there is the uh, Chinese uh, lander or and of course the, the rover vehicle uh, u2 and then u22 uh, u2 has died but u22 is uh, still operating after uh, I forget how many <laughs> uh, months now I think we're in uh, almost like 30 30 months or so so it's been there a, a long time uh, it doesn't drive very fast or very far we're talking you know hundreds of meters so far uh, but it's still operational after many uh, lunar day night cycles which is pretty impressive now, when you look at mobility, one of the key things uh, I always uh, think about is uh, the design of the wheels. Uh, without the proper wheels, uh, you can't uh, do much. <laughs> and so it's interesting to look at uh, the, the different wheel designs that have been um, used, I guess, on the lunar surface in this case, right? So uh, on the left, you see the Lunokhod wheel, uh, Lunokhod, uh, I think that's Lunokhod 2 wheel actually that you should see there. But anyway, it, it has sort of like a bike spokes in there uh, and then a, a metal mesh uh, with, with uh, grousers that are slightly put at an angle. Um, and so that's, a, as you saw from the previous picture, that on those wheels, it drove um, almost 40 kilometers. So that's a, a long distance. Then the Apollo uh, Lunar Roving Vehicle wheel uh, is also a metal uh, mesh here with um, titanium strips bolted onto it. And uh, those strips uh, prevent it from sinking in the loose material too deep. So it, it provides more, uh, let's call it floating um, power. And then uh, inside you can see some metal bands here uh, that prevented it from deforming too far basically. Right? So if you hit a rock or something, the, the metal mesh would deform, uh, but then it would bottom out on these uh, metal strips on the inside here. And then uh, newer versions of, the, of, uh, of that wheel have been uh, explored right now. And so uh, on the right here, you can see a redesign, if you will, of uh, a similar uh, style wheel, mesh wheel. But in this case, it's made uh, not out of piano wires uh, that were coated in metal like these were, uh, but in this case, out of uh, memory metal. So interesting uh, approaches to 
uh, mobility. And then, by the way, on, on the far right here, you can see the Mars rover wheel uh, from the Curiosity rover, uh, which when on, when on Mars was, was damaged quite a bit from driving over the rocks. And so this particular picture is actually from JPL, uh, which is specifically uh, a test set up to test the durability of the wheel. So it, the wheels basically just drive around on this track uh, until they break, essentially, and to study how they hold up. All right, so uh, other wheels, um, the U22 is what you see on the, on the left there, which is uh, very similar to the Lunacot wheel in many ways, uh, right? So it has the same kind of uh, mesh done with grousers. Uh, of course, it doesn't have the, uh, the, the bike style wheel, but uh, more like a solid metal uh, tree-like structure inside, uh, which is also, you can say, seem a similar kind of structure in this um, center picture here, which is, uh, a wheel that's designed by Canadensis uh, in, uh, in Canada, uh, which is uh, basically a flexible uh, metal wheel. So it, it doesn't have a mesh, but it has little metal plates that are attached to the center piece and they can uh, deform a little bit. So they can adjust uh, depending on what, what it drives over, if you will. And then on the, the picture on the right, uh, is one of the next uh, NASA rovers uh, that's going to go. It's called the Viper rover. So this is the, uh, the engineering uh, model to test out mobility specifically. Um, and you can see those wheels are uh, more, uh, again, like the uh, bike wheel with the spokes, a very light, very open wheel. Uh, but then it's a solid metal outside, uh, but it does have grousers here. Now, uh, the Viper rover is intended to go down into the permanently shaded regions and so uh, there is a possibility that the soil lunar regolith is a little looser there and so uh, they wanted to have a decent surface uh, area so they wouldn't sink in as far. Uh, that's why that has solid wheels. Now uh, those are obviously all fairly large vehicles, uh, but also there are lots of plans for smaller vehicles to go to the lunar surface. Um, and so there are a lot of examples uh, of that here. So iSpace uh, has, I forget exactly how heavy this is, but it's a very small rover, a Hakuto rover. You can see solid wheels, uh, again, but grousers on it. Um, then the Duaxle rover from JPL, it's basically two rovers that can tie together into one. Um, but they can split up and then by a cable, uh, one could say, let go into a, uh, uh, let's say a lunar lava tube or something like that. It could repel down, if you will, and then be pulled back up. Uh, so there's a variety of interesting uh, opportunities there. Um, but again, you can see fairly large uh, grousers there, solid uh, surfaces, so it wouldn't sink in. And then at the bottom center, you see the lunar outpost map rover so that's a, a company that is uh, sending those rovers to the moon and uh, again solid wheels with, uh, with fairly large uh, grousers um, but there's also other approaches such as the one on the bottom left which is the space bit asaguma rover and this actually has this is a cube set literally so it's 10 centimeters tall and wide uh, with four legs and so that's more of a spider-like uh, approach uh, and as a matter of fact uh, they they are slated to fly on uh, i think the first or the second clips mission depending on how the, which one will end up going uh, first so they have booked a slot on there and we're hoping to have them test in our facilities here very soon. Uh, and then on the right, you can see uh, a similar approach to the duaxle rover, but this is actually our T-Rex rover for, that deploys the superconducting cable. You can sort of see the cable here uh, being deployed down this slope. Um, but the, uh, the, the key here is that we're not driving on flat surfaces or going up the hill very much. Uh, we are mostly descending down into a crater. Um, and then once we reach the bottom of the crater, we would become stationary, uh, sort of your local charging uh, station for power uh, and your local Wi Fi hub. Um, and so most of the uh, traversing would actually happen down a pretty steep slope. And to be stable, uh, we came up with this idea of, a, uh, we call it sort of a ski basically, but the idea is that this, uh, you basically ride down in a controlled manner, uh, sort of pushing down uh, the regolith uh, down the slope a little bit. 
and that allows you to have a very controlled uh, not a slide down because you actually are driving down uh, but it, it uh, really stops you from getting out of control i'd imagine if you just had two wheels you would just keep rolling uh, no matter what you were trying to do here so this uh, really makes the whole descent much much more controlled now um of course, in the future, we want to send humans uh, back to the lunar surface. And as part of that, uh, we're no, not we are, but NASA and other people are designing vehicles to carry humans uh, around on the lunar surface. And then uh, I wanted to compare those to the Apollo lunar rover vehicle, as you see on the left, which is uh, completely open, right? So they, they had their spacesuits on, they just sat on a, like a, almost like a, a pool chair um just a metal frame with, with some uh, bands around it um but there's various different concepts and, and of course the lunar rover vehicle has not been selected yet and so the final version of this is not known uh, but there's been uh, several different versions designed right so the one that's been built and tested uh, in desert rats uh, is the nasa chariot rover uh, which is quite interesting uh, because it has a um a bottom platform here, which uh, is could be like a truck essentially. So it has six uh, independently movable. Uh, well, I guess it has twelve wheels, two per per uh, per wheel location. Uh, but in this case, they put a um, a human. Um, I don't know, camper almost on it basically that uh, allows you to, to use it as a transportation vehicle for, for people going basically in their shirt sleeve environments. Uh, there are suit ports in the back. And so if they wanted to go out for an extra vehicular activity, they can go into suits and then uh, step off the, the vehicle. Uh, but the interesting thing about this vehicle is that you could take this cabin off uh, of this vehicle and then it basically becomes a flat uh, bottom plate with with 12 wheels and so it becomes like a truck you can put other things on there to transport it um, or as they've also done they put a bulldozer blade on it and use it as a construction vehicle instead now other other concepts exist right so there's uh, recently there was the toyota lunar rover concept uh shown and if you look at the mobility differences between these different vehicles right so the lunar rover vehicle has four wheels uh front wheel steering uh, the chariot rover has, uh, let's say, six uh, independently movable points, six separately driven wheels, and each wheel can be moved up and down as well. So there's lots of degrees of freedom uh, for each of those wheels. And so this thing can, can rotate all its wheels and drive sideways uh, if you wanted it to. Um, then, of course, there's the, uh, the Toyota one, which has uh, six large wheels. Um, a uh, pretty interesting wheel concept uh, as well. Um, but one in the back and then two and two at the front here. So pretty interesting uh, concept there. I'm not quite sure how the steering of that vehicle uh, is supposed to work. Uh, that's mostly a concept that hasn't been built yet. So when you when you think about, you know, what determines uh, mobility and how effective you can be, um, there, there's very important factors uh, with that. The terrain trafficability is very, very important. And that's mostly determined by the slope, uh, by the amount of rocks that are there, and whether or not the um, surface uh, consists of very loose material or not. And the reason the loose material is important is because the, the Mars rover, the Spirit, uh, got stuck in the sand on Mars. As you can see in the, on the left here, uh, its wheel essentially just was just spinning around and it couldn't be taken out. So the, the rover got stuck in the sand and essentially eventually died there because it wasn't uh, in a good place to overwinter properly. Uh, so, you know, terrain trafficability is a, is a huge uh, deal here. We can drive over quite a variety of terrain, but, but there are definitely uh, limits to what we can do. And so it's very important to uh, realize where we can go and where we uh, should probably not go. Now, an important other factor to that is control, uh, because no matter how good your rover design is, uh, if, you, if you can't steer properly and you get stuck between obstacles or something like that and you cannot go get away from them, then that's a problem. Uh, likewise, you need to have enough traction. If you're not 
you don't have enough power, you, you, you're spinning your wheels because you, know, you don't have enough traction in the sand, um, or you're trying to pull something that's too heavy, uh, again, that's not, uh, not good, you, you're going to get stuck. Uh, slipping, of course, really important. It's not efficient to slip. Uh, and the other thing is that if you slip, you run the risk to end up just like uh, the Spirit Rover here in the sand. Um, uh, that is something that should be uh, avoided. However, uh, if you want to, for instance, use skid steering to turn, uh, then you at least have to have motors that are strong enough that allow you to slip. Otherwise, you cannot turn properly. And then, of course, uh, you know, what what is very important as well is whether or not it is remote controlled uh, with a human in the loop or if it is autonomous and has to make decisions, for instance, to detect whether or not my wheel is stuck or is digging itself in or not. Now, another part of that that ties directly with train trafficability is location and mapping. It needs to know where it is um, and, of course, where it is relative to potentially dangerous uh, areas where you could get stuck. And then on the moon, particularly in the permanently shaded regions, is also really important is visibility. Um, if there's never any light, then, then how are you going to see or detect any obstacles? Uh, you can use you know, laser, LIDAR, uh, you know, any kinds of different obstacles. You're just going to bring a light and use visible cameras. Uh, lots of different approaches uh, are possible there, but they definitely play a big role uh, in, in the mobility and also the safety. And on the moon, the lighting conditions are very strange because there's no atmosphere and you don't get any reflected light, uh, which means that, you know, you can't see what's in the shadow of the rock. Uh, right? so if there's a bigger rock and that, that rock poses a shadow on the ground, there might be a crater in that shadow, but you can't see it uh, because it's perfectly dark in that area. And that's, uh, that could be a challenge. All right. So slope and access are very important. There is a maximum slope that is easily traversable with rovers. Um, the same, of course, goes for landers. Um, I think uh, 12 degrees was the maximum slope uh, that the Apollo landers could uh, could handle it or take off again. If their slope was more than 12 degrees, then uh, they wouldn't have enough fuel to get back. Uh, and it was pretty close in some cases. Uh, either way, the uh, there's been some mapping done on the moon um, for figuring out how steep the slopes are. And in other words, how could you get down in the crater and what is the maximum slope you have to be able to overcome in that case. And as you can see from this picture, uh, which uh, was, was made by Kevin Cannon, um, he shows that you know there are paths down the crater that, in this case, it's Shackleton Crater right on the South Pole, uh, that do not exceed uh, 30 degrees here. Now there are some slope pieces here that, that are bigger than, than 30 degrees, but if you're at an angle on that slope, so not straight down, uh, you can still reduce your uh, effective angle to less than 30 degrees. But that tells me that your vehicle has to be able to drive down on a slope uh, uh, sideways almost. Okay. And then from mobility standpoint, rocks and, and big rocks are a big issue as well, uh, partially because of wear on the wheels, but also because you then have to drive over them or, or you know, zigzag between them, if you will. And so there's a lot of um, uh, software packages and software analysis done on orbital images uh, to detect where there are lots of rocks and, and, and where there are not. And so you could uh, avoid those areas, uh, or perhaps if you're interested in finding those rocks and studying the rocks to, to, to go there, but how to get there without getting into trouble to get stuck, for instance. Now, from a design standpoint, mobility, there's lots of different factors, so right? Size of the wheels, uh, what type of surface do you have? Uh, do I have grouses, yes or no? How many, how, how big, uh, are they straight or patterned? Um, then, you know, what kind of control do I have? Autonomy levels, uh, but also, can I automatically detect whether my wheels are slipping? Uh, do I have independently steering and driven wheels or are we just have, you know, just like a regular car uh, type uh, um, uh, steering? Now, you know, where the wheels are located makes a big difference too, uh, because if I have six wheels, then uh, let's say if I want to turn, that is a very different uh, operation than if I have, let's say, four wheels right on a circle uh, location. Uh, another one that's really, really important is speed. 
um, most of the vehicles drove uh, driven pretty slow. Um, you know, the Lunar Rover was <laughs> relatively quick uh, compared to a lot of the uh, the Mars rovers, for instance. Now, suspension obviously is very important, right? So, uh, Rocker Bogey is a, is a popular run for uh, for rovers, um, but I've seen uh, a lot of rover designs that have independable, independent, but also liftable wheels. So, those those uh, chariot wheels, for instance, you can lift them up individually. So, if one might get stuck. Right, you have still five other ones. You lift one up, uh, you drive a little bit out of the way of the obstacle, and then you put it back down again. Or if you're really stuck, it is actually possible uh, with those kinds of wheels to actually walk. So you could actually walk up a steep slope that you couldn't drive on. Um, so that there is that uh, option. Of course, that makes the whole system very complicated. Um, but then, of course, different materials and, and, and durability. Dust is a huge, huge issue uh, that we really don't know enough about at this point. Um, hence, my vacuum chamber and research, uh, wear tolerance. And then if you are going to stay there for a long time, very important to be able to ease, uh, easily maintain your system and be able to fix it. Um, you can't call AAA uh, or anything like that to come fix your flat. Now, when we talk about mobility, a very important aspect of that is, so why am I driving? All right, so where am I going uh, and, and how far? Uh, what is the purpose of my, my trip? So if, if it's science, all right, I, I'm not gonna go to the same place many, many, many times, right? So probably there might be some short locations I go to, uh, but you know, humans on, especially if in the, the chariot can do multi-day traverses, uh, and they might drive 100, 200 kilometers over a unique terrain, which means there is no road, no path, because you drive over it only once. Now, on the other hand, if you're going to do construction, excavation, and CT research utilization, then you might take shorter trips, but you might make the same trip many, many times, right? You go excavate a little bit, and you bring it back to the factory, and you go back and you excavate some more and you bring it back to the factory and you might do that hundreds of times uh, so that becomes more like driving on a road it's it's the same trip many many times but you may drive thousands of kilometers right They're very different use case very different uh, kinds of uh, requirements for your vehicle and then uh, if you want to transport things all right so cargo you got to offload it from, let's say, the lander. Uh, you want to put your habitats down or something like that. It could be very heavy. Uh, it could potentially be lopsided and so not evenly distributed. Uh, maybe you need to move a, a liquid oxygen tank uh, that's full with liquid oxygen or something like that. So you might have sloshing uh, liquids versus just solid cargoes. And of course, uh, a very delicate cargo is transporting people on the, the lunar surface right and that, that comes with a, its own set of requirements uh, from you know speed acceleration safety uh, and of course what other kinds of uh, equipment you have to carry uh, along now if i'm going to do any construction uh, for instance one of the key things we want to construct early uh, is a landing pad um, you know for for many, many reasons, but uh, the key part is that we really don't want to sandblast any of the structures uh, around it. And to do that, we need to have construction vehicles, right? So they have to be able to uh, grade, so make the surface flat, remove rocks, uh, maybe fill in craters, that sort of thing. Uh, and so to do that, you need to be able to put a tool on a vehicle, right? So there's two versions of a, of a bulldozer here in a way. Um, and that vehicle needs to be strong enough to push, uh, you know, the, the, the lunar regolith or the rocks out of the way. And so you need to create a lot of traction. And of course, you want to be able to be mobile, uh, back up and go back and forth, push, uh, get exactly the geometry that you, that you want. Now, um, when we talk about mobility, like I said, there's there's a lot of factors that play a role. And so as part of the NASA Lunabotics Mining Competition uh, that's been going on for 10 years, and uh, now I think we're about 500 teams or so that have built robots that uh, need to 
uh, drive on the lunar regolith and then excavate something and then drive back over the obstacle zone with rocks and craters and dump it in a collection box. Um, the, the, there's a lot of large variety of uh, different mobility uh, mechanisms people have built in. Uh, by, by far the most popular one are either four fixed wheels or tracks. Um, the third place comes in with six fixed wheels, uh, fixed meaning that they can't rotate independently. Uh, and then uh, a couple have, you know, four steerable wheels and, and it goes down a couple of very interesting ideas with augers, spinning augers, and things like that. Um, the interesting thing is that no matter what kind of uh, mobility system people had designed, um, that at the beginning, the first couple of years of the competition, uh, about half of the robots uh, tended to get stuck in the lunar simulant because uh, A, they didn't have simulant to test in at home uh, at, at their university. And uh, it behaves very different from, let's say, beach sand or, or other sand that they may have had access to. Um, and second of all, uh, very often the control systems were not good enough uh, to detect whether or not they were digging themselves a hole. Right? So the, the top left picture here uh, shows, uh, in this case, a North Dakota vehicle uh, that had four fixed wheels and they just completely dug themselves in. They couldn't go anywhere uh, anymore. They completely uh, sunken into the, the regolith basically. Um, but with, with better control and things like that, so a couple of years later, uh, they, they did much, much better. Right? And so the idea here is that you, you, you learn by doing these kinds of things. And typically after about uh, three years, uh, all the teams have kind of figured out. So, so three times participating in the competition, they all have figured out how to sort of do that. Um, so it's a very interesting competition where we've seen lots of different robot designs, um, but controlling your vehicle in the sense that detecting whether or not your wheels are spinning uh, not just saying on and then go full speed, but but ramping them up slowly. Uh, those kinds of things really make a big difference uh, in the overall performance uh, of the lunar rovers. Now I'm going to go through a little bit more of a uh, an analysis here uh, about you know what kind of mobility is actually needed if we're talking about uh, mining on the lunar surface. And so I wanna go briefly over uh, an engineering analysis that kind of shows you how uh, you could, you could uh, estimate those kinds of things. Now, in this case here, this is partially based on, on a Mars case, but it, it applies equally to uh, the lunar surface essentially. Um, but anyway, the idea is that we want to mine water, um, on, on the moon, there's, there's really two different uh, cases, main cases. One is granular materials, uh, which is almost anywhere, right? So they vary, um, but they all have up a lot of oxygen in them, right? So mineral, lunar minerals are about 40, 45% oxygen by, by mass. Uh, but of course, they're very energetic to break those bonds and, it, you know, but you can do it. Um, the other case, of course, is ice, right? So there's a variety of different indications that there is lots of ice on the moon. Um, now, we don't know exactly what form they are in, but we do know that there's, there's ice uh, there likely. And so you could uh, go mine the ice and split that in hydrogen and oxygen and get rocket propellant. Now on Mars, there's some other sources, hydrated minerals, buried glaciers, things like that, that you don't have uh, on the lunar surface. Uh, but again, you could mine those and, and do the same thing. So it, in a way it's, it's destination agnostic, it, it doesn't matter. Um, the idea is we are going to mine something, all right? So on the moon, uh, we wanna go to the permanently shaded craters with our rover. And if we can mine ice directly, high quantities of ice, we, we don't need to mine a lot, so a small, uh, purple square here. Uh, then maybe we can find some higher uh, concentration mineral fields. Uh, let's say um, some uh, volcanic glass that have high, uh, high water or oxygen content bound in the minerals. And then we have to uh, mine a medium uh, volume. But if you just randomly pick up lunar dust, you can still extract oxygen from it. And, but you do need to uh, extract quite a lot to get enough. So the vehicles go to their 
location, they dig, and then they go back to the uh, plant to deposit their uh, excavation material, uh, and then that gets processed, right? So the key here is that the vehicles need to traverse to wherever they're going to excavate, then they do their job, excavate, and then they traverse back and dump the excavation system, excavated material into the processing unit. Now then, of course, they can then recharge and, and, and communicate as needed, uh, and then again, go out uh, and dig some more. Now, uh, propellant processing happens in, in different ways. Okay, I'm not gonna go into uh, all of this, but there's a variety of different sources that might be of interest, right? And so you can make propellant uh, out of them. Now, the question that's very important for sizing of the vehicles, and this also relates to mobility, is how much do we really need to, to excavate and transport, all right? And so uh, there's lots of different scenarios for lunar water. Right? So depending on, on who you consider the customer and uh, how many activities you think are going to happen, uh, it varies a lot depending on the study that you, you uh, look at. So it can vary from uh, NASA, which estimates we need tens of tons per year, to a different study that says with all the lunar activities, uh, such as you know, Starship going there uh, from SpaceX, we might need uh, two and a half thousand metric tons per year. Right? So quite big orders of magnitude different. Um, but of course, you know, we'll start small and build up from there. Another popular um, uh, potential resource is helium-3. Uh, however, helium-3 is implanted by the solar wind, and so the concentrations are uh, fairly low. And so if you want to get one kilogram of helium-3, you would have to excavate approximately 50,000 metric tons of lunar regolith. And then, of course, you know, process that. Um, on Mars, right, so 16 metric tons uh, is uh, water is what's needed to get uh, the Mars ascent vehicle to refuel to go back to Earth. Uh, or if it's a SpaceX Starship, about 400 metric tons. So this is kind of how much we need to collect. Now, to put that in perspective, uh, and this is a, a Mars case here, right, so how much uh, Martian material would I have to excavate and transport uh, for 16 metric tons uh, of water? Now, depending on what kind of resource you're going to excavate, you need more or less uh, material. So if you just get you know, random regolith anywhere on Mars um, and you heat it up to 300 degrees Celsius, you need about 2 uh, million kilograms. So 2000 metric tons. Uh, if you uh, pick it up uh, and heat it up to 150 uh, degrees, Actually, I think those might be switched around actually. I think 300 degrees is a lower amount. But anyway, um, if you go for the clays, uh, let's say smectite, then you can uh, only need to collect about half a million uh, kilograms. Or if you wanna go for hydrated minerals, such as uh, gypsum, which is about 20% uh, water by mass, uh, you only need 186,000 kilograms, right? So uh, that's, that's a, you know, factor of 10 less material you have to collect if you go after the gypsum. Um, not bad. So if you can find gypsum, that means you have to excavate far less. Now, the other thing is that the energy required to process this material is, of course, another factor in the design as well of the whole system. And what we found is that gypsum is actually energetically very, very useful because it, uh, the water comes out uh, at, at like 200 degrees Celsius or so. And so if you need to heat 2000 metric tons up to 300 degrees Celsius, then that costs a lot more energy than heating only, let's say 200,000 uh, kilograms to 200 degrees Celsius, right? So there's, a, there's an important energy piece here, right? But we're interested in a transportation uh, component here. All right, so that's from an excavation stand for, uh, um, uh, what's it called, rocket propellant production. Now, if you're going to build a lunar base, for instance, and this is just an example of, of a lunar base layout, uh, there are things that you need to create, such as landing pads and roads. Uh, maybe you wanna put your habitat somewhere, you wanna bury it, right? So uh, those excavators have to do quite a lot of work. And so 
in this analysis that was done in this paper in 2007, um, the initial excavation, the, the volumes that need to be done, are actually very large for the landing pad and berms and mitigation strategies, according to this particular design, right? And so uh, over uh, the first couple of years, the amount of excavation for civil engineering, right, so building the infrastructure is many times higher than for mining rocket propellant in this case, right? So in this case, 84% is for construction and 16% is uh, for mining. And so when you design your vehicles and your mobility systems, uh, you know, you need to design for what it is going to do, right? Now, like I said, the landing pad construction, you need construction vehicles such as a chariot with uh, bulldozer blades, um, and that one has to clear uh, rocks, for instance, right? And so uh, the question is, how many rocks can you expect? Or if you're going to a certain area, how many rocks uh, when you're driving around can you expect in a certain area? Now on Mars, they've done extensive analysis from orbital pictures and, and of course ground truthing that with the rovers that have driven around on Mars to figure out how many rocks uh, are in a given picture uh, based on some of the big ones you see and then what kind of a model, what kind of curve, uh, small, medium, very small rocks, uh, how, how does that correlate? And so they found the different models here, uh, different places uh, that match fairly well to certain uh, mathematical equations. And so you can use those equations to predict how many rocks there are uh, from orbital pictures. Now, the same thing has been done for, for the lunar surface as well. Um, so you can look at, for instance, the uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter pictures uh, and then make, you know, count rocks and then say, well, okay, well, how many rocks of this size are there? So, well, how many smaller rocks do we expect? So from a path planning standpoint, that's a very useful uh, thing to know. Now, uh, in this case, if we want to build a landing pad, I want to, you know, uh, collect a certain number of rocks, for instance, to build with, right? I got to make an estimate of how far I have to go to pick up rocks and how many rocks I have to pick up uh, and thus how many, you know, square kilometers I would have to pick up rocks from. Again, this has to do with, you know, what does my vehicle have to be able to do uh, when I design it? Now, this is just an example calculation to build a landing pad of a certain size. Um, so in this case here, right, so we need to um, collect rocks uh, from a certain area, right? So in this case, 31,000 square meters, which is a fairly sizable area, uh, but it's not crazy. I mean, these things can be done by fairly small systems if you have enough time. So from a uh, total area here, right? So uh, in this case, a two kilometer by two kilometer square uh, would give you enough uh, rocks, in this case, to build uh, a landing pad using those rocks. So two kilometers by two kilometers, that's that's a sizable area. Uh, but again, if you have 480 days, you know, that's a fairly small uh, amount of uh, square footage or square meters per day that you have to do. Now, the question is, do we need something like this to uh, do that excavation and, of course, you know, be able to drive back and forth? Now, the answer is no, we don't need something like that. Um, but maybe do we need to do any blasting or anything like that? Right. So if you talk about vehicles that have to drive uh, on something that was just blasted, that's really not good for, for wheels, for instance. Uh, so do we need to do that sort of a process? Uh, do we need a lot of loading and hauling, right? So again, these vehicles have very interesting wear and mobility issues that, that you have to deal with. Uh, there are plenty of pictures of vehicles like this that have the axle snapped in two, uh, or you know they tumble off, off a road or something like that. So uh, very rough uh, environment to work in. But this is kind of what we're going to be doing on the moon. We're going to be mining, maybe not at this scale, but still. And so there's other ways to do it. So you can see uh, a surface miner instead of blasting and, and scooping it up. So they have uh, more like belts and small um, tracked vehicles. Uh, but again, the, the, the hauling system here is a, is a truck. And what's interesting is that 
we have an excavation vehicle and a separate hauling vehicle. And so from a mobility standpoint, the hauling vehicle drives the long distances, whereas the excavation vehicle here, it still has to move, but it moves only short distances. Now, when you translate that to, to the moon, how, does, how do you design a vehicle for those kinds of circumstances, right? So the mobility, as well as the, the hauling capacity, the, the right traction, uh, all these kinds of details uh, play a very important role. Now, the traction you need for your mobility system directly translates or of course correlates with what kind of excavation forces you're going to have to uh, encounter. And so if you have a backhoe or a bucket ladder or a blade, these forces vary a lot. And of course, because you're dealing with a natural material, uh, there is a, quite a bit of variation uh, in, in, in that uh, force that you can expect. And so your traction system, your mobility system has to be able to deal with that. Now, in, in this case, the Chariot Rover had, you know, 12 wheels. Uh, our little vehicle here that we built had, had four wheels that are fixed. So we were skid steering there. So there's no turning of the wheels directly. Um, and then, you know, you can see again, there's tracked versions of vehicles as well. Uh, tracks work okay, uh, but they have their own issues because what we find is that a lot of sand uh, can get stuck or lunar regolith between uh, the sprockets here and the tracks. And eventually uh, you get enough um, regolith in between here so that the tracks actually run off of the sprockets and then you're basically stuck. So the tracked vehicles are, are pretty good, uh, but they do have their own challenges. Right, a lot of different variation of those uh, different vehicles. Again, this is at the Lunabotics uh, mining competition. Uh, different variations. Here we have another tracked version, uh, and here we have a six-wheeled rover, uh, fixed wheels. Uh, different uh, different versions of different systems. Uh, we did find that the tracked one worked really well. Uh, it, it, it drove straight over the rocks and the craters, so it didn't really bother with it. Um, the six-wheeled rover did okay as well. Uh, so what are, there's many different mobility systems that can work well, uh, but you have to control it properly. That's that's the key. Now, of course, you test them in the lab uh, and in the sandboxes and stuff like that, but the sandbox is not exactly like uh, the field. And so there's lots of field testing that gets done uh, for mobility systems as well. Uh, so this was uh, several different uh, desert rats, and, and in this case, uh, Hawaii field test as well that was done. And so uh, you have to go in the field and, and explore things because the lab is, is just not totally representative. This is another reason why we have that thousand acre facility at Michigan Tech where you can test in the field uh, how things uh, behave. Now let's go back to our driving question here. So if we're going to collect all of that material and we have an excavator rover such as the Razor, which is a pretty uh, well-developed vehicle. Uh, it can carry about 40 kilograms on each side uh, and it can traverse fairly slowly at 25 centimeters per second. Now with some other assumptions, uh, we say, well, how, how long does it take to collect all of that material? Well, let's make a short model here. So we have the factory, we drive to the excavation zone, we excavate until we are full and we drive back, we unload, uh, and then we go back and excavate more, et cetera, et cetera. And so in year one, you would excavate a certain amount. And then next year, if you wanna refill your Mars Ascent vehicle, you can't mine the same spot because you've already ex excavated there. So you may have to go further. So the model says, well, next time you have to go you know, the same distance of the red arrow, but you have to drive a little further and then excavate uh, zone two. Now, what kind of uh, design does a good job? Well, there's lots of different pieces that, that make a good design um, when you talk about driving long distances, okay? Um, lots of pieces that go into a system uh, that, that performs uh, really well. And so it's not just the mobility design, it's also how big is my rover as a whole, right? So how much can I carry? How long do I excavate? Uh, how much excavation forces do I expect? And thus how much drawbar force or traction do I have to generate? Uh, how uh, mobile am I? Can I avoid obstacles? Things like that. Now, when we look at the 
total travel analysis of a vehicle like the Razor, in this case, it was on Mars, right? So we're looking at 2000 metric tons uh, for the regolith uh, at 425K. Um, we have the clay case and again, the gypsum case. And so we were looking at how far or how many trips do we have to make to excavate that amount of material? Um, you know, how many trips? Well, in this case, if I have 2000 metric tons, I need more than 25,000 trips with the Razor vehicle, right? Because it can carry 80 kilograms at a time. Um, and then, you know, let's say we can, we only can go about a hundred meters far it's to, my, to my excavation zone here, uh, because otherwise, if I go further, I cannot do it fast enough within the 480 days, right? So that's when my human crew would arrive. And so I have to be done excavating. And even so, even with, with that case, I still need three excavators to be able to do it within the given time frame of 480 days, right? And so um, 25,000 trips of less than 100 meters at three excavators, and it still takes me 382 days. Whereas if I was gonna excavate gypsum, which is the one down here, uh, which is far less material, I still need to make you know more than 2000 trips um, and I only need one excavator. And if I excavate gypsum, I can actually do it in 88 Martian days, 88 souls. So that's that's really fast actually, because we had 480 souls. So basically that means that if my gypsum is within hundred meters of the lander, uh, my vehicle can be significantly smaller. Uh, but on the other hand, if I have to go further away, let's say my landing ellipse is not as accurate and I land three kilometers away from my gypsum field. Uh, well, in that case, I need two excavators and it will take me 453 souls to, to drive back and forth and collect enough material. All right, so this kind of a study allows you to, to see, well, you know, is this excavator a good design for this kind of uh, scenario, right? And, and the Razor in this particular case is not designed for long distance driving. And so it's not, it's not very suitable for that particular task. Um, all right, so again, putting that in perspective, the current vehicle, the furthest vehicle has driven 45 kilometers, right? But if I talk about, uh, you know, Mars, 25,000 trips, we need to drive 5,000 kilometers, right? So that's a factor of a hundred more. So two orders of magnitude more distance that the vehicle would have to traverse in its, in its lifetime, in this case, actually in 480 souls. So that is a completely different design problem, right? And so from a mobility standpoint and an excavation standpoint, that is a completely different vehicle. Now, when you look at, you know, if I go a certain distance, how long do I spend driving versus how long do I spend excavating? And, you know, the, the razor in this case does both, right? It excavates and then it hauls the material away. So is that really an excavator or is it a truck? Right? Because if I design it to be like the perfect excavator, it's probably not a very good truck. So it doesn't drive very fast or very far. And so when you design a system, you kind of have to, to say, well, what is, what is my dominant occupation? Am I driving long distances? Well, then I would design my uh, mobility system completely different than if I have to drive only short distances and not very often, right? And this is why on earth we have specialized vehicles. We have an excavator, right? That focuses on excavation. And we have a truck that focuses on transportation. But if you can only send one vehicle to, to the moon or to Mars, right, it kind of needs to do both of those tasks. So you have to design it very differently from an excavator or a truck as an individual, right? Because, you know, you go far away, you might, you know, spend only 1% of your time excavating and 99% of your time driving. So in conclusion, um, Mobility over long distances will be crucial for human transportation, right? For, to get to your science targets, as well as for things like mining, going down into craters, uh, or in this case, if you want large quantities of material, you gotta go back and forth many, many, many times. Um, now the right size is uh, very 
varies a lot depending on what the resources are and how far you got to go. But a key thing to take away is that ISRU vehicles that have to drive thousands of trips, they are not like the science machines that we have been designing to go to other planets. These have to be industrial grade production machines that can handle many thousands of trips, uh, can operate for many, many years without maintenance. Uh, they do repetitive actions, not drive over, you know, terrain nobody's ever gone over. It's basically on a road to a certain extent. Um, so it's repetitive, but it is still hard to automate those actions. And a key thing, dust, dust, dust will get everywhere. It wears the systems out and it is hard to design for. We, we don't really know what the effects are of the dust long-term on systems, uh, that we just haven't had any system that lasted long enough. And then of course, rocks. A lot of tests are done in these nice test beds and there are really no rocks in there. On the moon and the Mars, there are rocks all the time. So uh, don't forget about your rocks when you do tests with your mobility system. So that's, uh, that's all I wanted to share with you today. I, uh, Thank you for your time. And if there's any questions and we have any time left, then uh, I'll be open for that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Paul. Uh, it's a very nice talk. <clears throat> I mean, the, in fact, the first time I spent an hour listening to this uh, random mobility. <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I should mention that the, to the audience that uh, obviously, uh, <laughs> Professor Paul Sosante, he is a civil engineer. <laughs> Right, and uh, the, he, he, he got his uh, bachelor's degree from um, Te U, uh, Delft, um, Holland, and then, they, and then went on to, to uh, Colorado School of Mining. Um, and is that a uh, system engineering or engineering of systems? I, 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 you have to tell us. Oh, it's engineering systems. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's called that because it was a mixture of civil, mechanical, and electrical engineering, basically. So it's an interdisciplinary degree. Okay. Um, anyone in the audience have questions? If you have, you know, please unmute yourself and ask the question. If uh, I didn't put you all to sleep. <laughs> if not, and then the, uh, I ask some questions because I, I watched the slides and, and uh, some places interest me uh, very much. Uh, there's one sentence calling uh, about, the, about the requirement. You said that the specialist was a generous requirement. What does it mean? Well, so this, this is what I was talking about for the, you know, do, are you designing an excavator or a truck, right? Okay. So you, you, a specialist would be something that does one thing really well, but it doesn't do the other thing very well. So an excavator does, does excavation really well, but it doesn't drive long distances very well, right? So a generalist, it's like a Swiss army knife. It does everything but it does nothing really well, <laughs> right? So, so a Swiss army knife is great because it helps you out in, in, a, in a tough situation, but it, it does not replace the perfect hammer or the perfect saw, right? You can saw something with it, but it's, but it's not a very good saw. You mm. know what I mean? It can do many things, but it doesn't do them very well. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the generalist approach. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what, you know, a lot of people are trying to do with the lunar vehicles because we can only send one. And so mm -hmm. they want to make that one thing do everything. Mm -hmm. But that also means it doesn't do anything very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so if we're going to do lots of excavation, we may have to specialize. And instead of having one vehicle, maybe send two, one excavator and one truck. So you talk about ISR, you have to, those uh, trucks or whatever here, vehicles have go back and forth, back and forth for, for what, thousand, thousand times, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And then the wear and tearing problem, then we also uh, know that the, the dust on the, the lunar dust that they were sharp edged, does that vary you? Yes, it does. Um, one of the anecdotes I, I like to, to share with my students often is that, you know, the, the, the Apollo astronauts, they, they had uh, their spacesuits so when they went outside uh, on their extravehicular activities, uh, they got covered in, in the lunar dust and stuff like that. Right? And then went back inside, they took off their spacesuit, and then the next day they would put it back on. Now, their uh, couplers, right? So the, the seals from, let's say, the, the gloves that would be, you know, with aluminum sort of snapped on to the rest of their spacesuit, that seal had degraded by 80% after three EVAs. So if they would have done one more EVA, 
they would not have been able to seal their, their suits properly anymore. They would have had a, developed a leak essentially, right? And so that was because of the lunar dust. And so, yes, it worries me greatly that you know, we, we don't really know long-term, and in this case, we don't really have good long-term data, right? Mm-hmm. How that dust is going to affect our systems. Mm-hmm. And so it's very important to uh, make systems that if it wears, it's okay. We can, you know, it's not like a nanometer tolerance because it's going to wear over time. And so you need to create systems that can handle that, that wear and, and uh, abrasion due to the lunar dust. Of course, dust is everywhere on the moon, you know, it's, it's troublesome. Right. Um, you get to blow it away. So. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, also, you, uh, some place you mentioned that you want to mine uh, helium free. But you're mining here and free. You want to bring it back to the earth, right? Or you want to use it on on the on the moon? Well, I mean, I I looked at helium three very long ago. That was actually one of the first things I did as a student, just to you know design a lunar base that does that. Um, but you know, personally, I don't think it's that interesting of a resource at the moment um, because I don't think there's really a market for it. There is a small medical market right now, but people always talk about it as being you know potential uh, fusion. Um, uh, fuel, but of course, you know, we don't have any working fusion reactors, so there isn't really a customer for it. So it's a hypothetical case uh, mm. that shows, you know, you could get this volatile, but it requires huge amounts of, of regular to be processed, right? So very large scale operations. And so it's an extreme case from an industrial scale mm. standpoint, mm. Uh, how much you would have to process. So uh, my... my goal or my, my uh, realistic scenario would be to mine uh, either oxygen or, or water at first okay. and yeah. create the rocket propellant. And the helium tree might become interesting later. Mm-hmm. So f- to mine water, you have to go to the South Pole. You have to go to deep down in the, you know, in the, in the shadow bottom of the craters. And there, that's why you have this project uh, having the superconducting cable going, you know, uh, going down. But I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that if you, you're sending a, a rover to, to the Mars with, with a po- nuclear power generator, then why can't you do that you know, on, on the moon so that then you don't need to just have... I mean, I'm not saying that you, your project is very nice, you know, the superconducting, uh, very inventive. But I'm saying that if you have a nuclear power generator on the moon, then, then the power requirement will be less, you know, less severe. Uh, well, you know... The, you still need to transfer the power from wherever you generate it to mm. wherever you need it. And then those are not necessarily in the same place. And so uh, the nice thing about a superconducting cable in that case, that you can still connect, let's say the power station to uh, your uh, habitat or uh, your, let's say ice production facility or something like that, or to your recharge station. And the superconduction means you get basically zero losses and your cables can be very small because mm-hmm. you know you have no heat generation uh, by by resistance, and so you, you mm-hmm. have very small cables necessary to transfer mm-hmm. huge currents, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. So the final question is that when do you think all this is going to happen? You know, um, well, uh, all of this—that was a pretty broad spectrum, right? So, <laughs> um, if you mean when are we going to start mining? Uh, and yeah, producing, right, right, let's say, uh, right. oxygen and hydrogen. Put, put this uh, way, I mean, I mean what well, means that when the, the the I think that the milestone would be when when you could do ISR, you uh, pick up enough water to sustain you know, the the human activity on on, on the moon. Is it? That would be mm-hmm. a milestone. So when would that happen? Well, what's interesting is that you really don't need a lot of water to sustain humans. You need mm-hmm. a lot more water for the rocket propellant. Uh, mass mm-hmm. ones, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, if you just wanted to sustain humans uh, for the life support systems, or let's say take a shower, um, then you know we could do that in let's say the next uh, probably ten years easily. Um, right? So, so you you could you could shower on the moon ten years from now. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we we could uh, get enough water to be able to do that. Yes. Yeah, and so NASA, is, yeah, NASA's yeah. plans uh, call for, no, of course, that, that's subject to change, but they call for a pilot plant in 2028 that produces, I think, 10 metric tons of water in a year. 10, that, that, 10 is the, that is the current ton. schedule. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
and that is uh, good enough for what? For doing what? Uh, for, uh, for rocket fuel or? Yeah, that would be rocket propellant. Uh, mm -hmm. So to go back up to, to orbit and uh, go mm -hmm. back to the, um, uh, whatever it's called, uh, the, the new gateway. space station. Yeah. The gateway, mm -hmm. yes. That's mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I think the time is, I mean, it, it, I mean, you, you spend a whole hour talking about it, you know, that's great, you know. <laughs> I can talk about it for days. <laughs> I know, I know. And then, and then you have a huge, um, huge facility, huge enterprise in, 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 in Michigan Tech. And then, and, uh, and we look forward to, you know, much more you know, interesting results from you. And then the... Yeah, we were happy to have it finally uh, online with COVID. We had very long delays, so it's been a mm -hmm. long, long journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, we're now commissioning it. We're doing lots of tests uh, to mm -hmm. see how it be, how it works. And uh, we're excited to put some real lunar hardware in it soon. Yeah. And uh, and uh, we would uh, periodically, you know, invite you back to, to, to give talks. And, then, and so, so thank you again, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for your attention. I was uh, yeah. happy to uh, entertain some some interested <laughs> folks about my uh, my my passion. <laughs> so. Right, right, great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and uh, in the afternoon, you know, we have a further further uh, uh, lectures, and you you are very welcome to to you know to 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 listen to participate also. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you. But I think I'm gonna go take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good night. Uh, then. <laughs> 11 p 11 p.m. here. So gonna get up <laughs> early at six tomorrow. So right. anyway, thank you again for having yeah, me. Thank uh, you.